Okay. Are we live? I don't know if we're live or not. Oh, God. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, we're live, Tamara. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, David. Um, <laughs> good morning, okay. Angela. Good morning. I guess we'll start by introducing ourselves. Um, yeah. My name is Angela Jones. Uh, Tamara is responsible for bringing us together. Uh, to the listening audience, um, we could not hear Tamara, so she <laughs> is in the backdrop and has decided to let David and I co-host her show. So thank you, Tamara. She is of the mind that the show must go on. And we are here to touch and agree that the show will go on. So I am one of the co-hosts here, Tamara for Georgia, yay. I am one of the co-hosts, my name is Angela Jones. And I live in Southern California. I am a proud core member of the ADOS SoCal movement, which is a chapter of the ADOS national movement. And our biggest fight right now is for reparations for American descendants of slavery. I work in work comp law by day as a litigator and negotiator uh, to get the doctors paid for the treatment that they've rendered to the injured workers mm -hmm. here in Southern California. And I am the proud mother of a beautiful 15 year old daughter named Genesis. So my plate is pretty full down here, fighting for reparations and fighting locally to help ADOS uh, with unemployment and underemployment, affordable housing and homelessness. So that's my cliff note version of uh, my life here in Southern California, beautiful Southern California. And David, who are you since I'm just now getting to know you? Oh, well, I, I've uh, been uh, uh, working with Tamara for about three, four years. And uh, we do uh, uh, work on, uh, on uh, racial justice issues and try to model, you know, how we can uh, um, bridge the divide first by acknowledging the divide, which is my um, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, website. And, um, uh, and then I, I am a, uh, a historian. I've been teaching history for at the college level for about 30 years. And uh, I was a blue collar organizer for about eight or nine years before I went to graduate school. So that's my, my uh, uh, thumbnail of my background. Uh, for uh, listeners on this, on this uh, radio, on this video cast, I need no introduction, <laughs> as they <laughs> say, because I've been doing it for now for many years, um, working with Tamara and then on our show for the last year and a half. So, um, uh, why don't we talk about ADOS a little bit and uh, what kind of, and and um, uh, at the same time, I think it would be important for us to um, do a little bit of, uh, of review of the Democratic debate last night and some of the issues that it, that it raises, um, both for ADOS uh, issues and also for uh, the future of the uh, of politics, you know where the politic what the political direction is that that we're going in. So, <clears throat> um, I guess that's uh, that. If that's okay with you, that would be our agenda for the for the morning. Sounds wonderful. Um, let me just back up a little bit. Yeah, uh, Tamara flashed about the Friends of ADOS Super PAC. I forgot to mention that 
Okay. Uh, myself and Marlon Aldridge from Dayton, Ohio, formed Friends of ADOS Super PAC, which we intend to launch uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, this October 4th and 5th at the ADOS inaugural conference in Louisville, Kentucky, where Marion Williamson, who speaks yeah. loud about reparations, mm -hmm. is the only presidential candidate to date to take an invitation to come and speak with us. So uh, I did want to mention that Super PAC is going to be used to advertise on behalf of ADOS who are running for office so that we can start to get our voices uh, within the House and the Senate, uh, which will prayerfully help us with our justice claim. Uh, the ADOS movement, and I know they've had many guests on that may see this differently. I really don't know. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I got involved. After two terms of Barack Obama, and after we showed up to the polls to ensure he uh, got into office for two terms, uh, at the end of his second term, after waiting on uh, President Obama to do something for ADOS, who placed him into office for two terms, I found that we were worse off in many respects. Um, we were experiencing unemployment disproportionate to the rest of the country, uh, although uh, the employment numbers didn't really reflect that. A lot of our jobs have been replaced by gig jobs like Uber and companies where we had no protections, no benefits, uh, l suppressed wages, uh, things of this nature, which skew the unemployment numbers. Um, we were being murdered by the police who weren't being brought to task on these issues. Um, weren't being brought to trial, weren't being convicted for murder. Um, we're just able to say they were afraid for whatever reason that the person pulled out a cell phone or reach for anything, just annihilation. That was happening on his watch and all we got were apologies. Um, the incessant drone wars were problematic for me. Um, Obamacare was too expensive for people who are unemployed and underemployed. It was even expensive for me. Um, I think a, I had a quote of $500 per month with an $8,000 deductible on $50,000 a year. Um, if $8,000 deductible, if I had to be hospitalized. All of these things were problematic because if I, in, in Southern California, earning half of what I once did when I worked in banking, could not even afford to spend $14,000 if I were to become sick. Um, if that was hard for me, operating at half my salary, then what did that mean for other ADOS? They, they clearly couldn't afford it. So what was happening was the burden of the people who couldn't afford it was being placed on the low, now lower middle class coming from a six figure income in banking. So I started uh, looking at Bernie Sanders and asking, well, who is this Bernie Sanders? He was all over the Facebook. So he clearly had millennials working for him. He clearly had taken a chapter out of Barack Obama's book and I liked a lot of what he had to say. So while working for his campaign, I got introduced to Yvette Carnell from the YouTube show, black political show, Breaking Brown. 
around 2014, I, I believe I started following her. And then I got introduced to Antonio Moore from Tone Talks. And those two started talking about black politics, which I was never informed about a lot of the things they were talking about because a lot of us vote blue no matter who. That's what we've been conditioned to do for 60 years to what I believe is our peril. We've made no demands. And every time we try to make a demand of the government, we try to make a demand of the presidential candidates, we're told to wait because there are other problems that are greater. Like this election cycle, everybody wants us to shift our priority from reparations to unseating Trump. But I don't see a difference between the devil and Satan. And I believe that a lot of Republicans are on the Democratic side. Elizabeth Warren was a Republican for most of her adult life. And she admits, you know, you could just check it out on YouTube to taking dark money. So who do you work for? You can take Bernie's talking points to get elected, but ultimately you vote for who pays you. You, you work for who pays you. So listening to the, the Black po political side of things and how we are fighting against becoming the permanent underclass in the country that our ancestors built with their lives, is it prompted a movement. Basically what happened was in 2016, Yvette Carnell uh, crafted the hashtag ADOS to give us a distinction because black immigrants had more wealth coming into this country than we do here. And they double dip. They go into these colleges and they take advantage of entitlements and scholarships that were intended for ADOS to make us whole. Then they climb right over top of us and get the high paying jobs while we're left behind as the legs of the table everyone eats from. So Yvette Carnell crafted the distinction for ADOS so that we could clearly see who is entitled to the justice claim. And it's not to say that if they descend from slaves in their respective countries that they aren't due entitlement. But it is to say if, you, if your lineage is not from American descendants of slaves, Africans who were brought over here in chains in 1619 to work this land under the most heinous, brutal chattel slavery ever known to the born world. If you don't come from that lineage, then you aren't entitled to reparations in this country. Well, when she did that and then Fast forward to January of this year, Kamala Harris throws her hat into the race at Howard University on MLK Junior Day. A much more informed ADOS is going to look into her record before we play this identity, respectability, vote blue, no matter who politics, because we've been studying for five years. And we're very awake to how even the Democrats have been working against our interest. Barack Obama said no to our reparations. Um, often talked respectability politics to us, called us thugs when we were outraged in Baltimore about Freddie Gray's murder at the hands of the police. So we definitely recognize that Kamala is black, but we also understand she's an immigrant. She is of East Indian Brahmin caste. And although her father is Jamaican, the jury is still out as to whether or not he's black Jamaican or is he Indian Jamaican. And by his own admission, he descends, his father owns slaves in Jamaica. And so, good morning, Cheryl. Thank you for joining the live. So anyway, 
we started digging into her history because she looks like us. We understood just like Barack Obama looked like us, that he was Kenyan and white. And he descends from slave owners on his white side here in this country. Well, when we started looking into her record and we found out her record on prison was not as on, on jailing us, ADOS, was not as progressive as she liked to announce to the country. And then we found out that she would not prosecute Steve Mnuchin for wrongful foreclosures on ADO, ADOS homes in Northern California. We realized she is an enemy to the ADOS people. And then she had the unmitigated gall to say she intends to do nothing for ADOS specifically if she were to become president. So she's just taking a chapter out of President Obama's book who begged the question after, of course, he got two terms. Um, he just said, I'm not black. I, I'm not the president of, of black Americans or something to that effect, I'm paraphrasing. But basically he let himself off the hook from having to do anything specific for ADOS people whom everyone benefits from the wealth that we now have in this country. We were the machines before the industrial revolution. We were the shoes that this country built all of its wealth on, not just the government, the banks, the insurance companies. We were less than animals and treated less than animals. And so all the wealth that's been calcified at the top out of 107 trillion household dollars, white people benefit from about 104 trillion. And of that 3 trillion that remains, 90% of ADOS people only benefit from around 700 billion. This is problematic and it's problematic for presidents that look like me who want my vote to think it is okay to not grant us the reparations, not in a form of charity, but it is a debt. So anywho, I'm almost done with this segment. Shari Mitchell went on the Joy Ann Reed morning show after Kamala's poll numbers started to be impacted by the work we were doing on YouTube, informing ADOS about Kamala's record. We didn't have the privilege or the benefit of Barack's record. He really didn't have a record when he ran for president. We had some things he did locally for Chicago politics, but not any real track record on how on what he did, how he performed, anything like that. So once we started to impact Kamala's poll numbers, the next thing we know, Shireen Mitchell goes on the Joy Henry morning show and starts referring to us as Russian bots. That's been America's go-to since Hillary lost fair and square <laughs> in 2016. Okay, so, uh, We became the Russian bots. And so the movement happened to us in, in defense of that narrative to let this country know that ADOS and our demands for reparation is real. We're tangible people. We are descendants of slaves fighting to not be the underclass in the country that our ancestors built with their lives. Thank you, Shamika. I see you. No, it's not okay. None of it's not, none of it's okay. And so it, it's just problematic that, well, the movement had to be formed. We've got about 30 chapters throughout the country so far, 15 states, 30 chapters, and we're gearing up for our, our inaugural conference 
where, like I said, Marion Williamson has been on reparations. This is not for political expediency where she's concerned. She gets that this country will never be it, its full potential without repairing uh, the American descendants of slaves. And she's the only one speaking full-throated about that, the only candidate that has offered to come to the inaugural conference to speak on it. But she's been on reparations since she wrote um, her book, uh, The Heart of America, or Healing the, Heart, Healing the Heart of America, back in 97. Unlike some of the other candidates who are pretending to be for reparations by paying Congress to study our repair into perpetuity under H.R. 40. We don't have time to study what we know is already due. We've had our lead economist, Dr. Sandy Darity, put together the trillions we are owed. And we have a whole list of demands outside of the check, which, you know, the government is not trying to cut checks. They want to give us more programs that they can give with one hand and take away with the other, just like they did our civil rights. It went to white women, immigrants, everybody but us. Uh, it started to get dispersed and spread out that way. We have no protections under the law. Even out here in Southern California, it is so bad that you now have to know Spanish just to get an interview. And that still doesn't guarantee you a job because we have no social capital in Southern California. We have no one that looks like us or that descends from us in places to hire. So we are left to be hired by immigrants and white people. And without any protection under the law, like we once did affirmative action, which is why that was needed in corporate America because left to their own devices, they don't readily hire ADOS. And we have gone from 15% in Southern California to 6%. We have 40% of the homeless on Skid Row that are ADOS. So um, it, 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 we are, this is, a, this is DEF CON 4 for my people. We are fighting, fighting very hard for the reparations because it is a debt that is owed and it is very necessary. We're being pushed out of Southern California. And so that's why we're not just for reparations and, and also fighting to protect the 1866 Reconstruction Era Civil Rights Law that Comcast whom we subscribe, 40% of their subscriber base is ADOS. And yet Comcast and Trump's seven lawyers from Trump's Department of Justice have appealed to the Supreme Court to get a different interpretation of the 1866 law that enables us to sue for discrimination and being locked out of access to white capital, which is ADOS capital. So we're fighting that, gearing up for a boycott against Comcast, and we're fighting for reparations, and locally we're fighting for uh, the rights for ADOS to work the new railways that are being built, to work at the ports. These jobs have been run over, taken over by Mexicans. We're fighting for our people to have shelter here in Southern California. Uh-oh, I can't hear you, David. What happened? I don't know. Oh, there um, we go. I can hear you now. Um, I... Um I have a feeling that uh, that a lot of people are hearing this in an ex in a uh, very um, um, exclusive, uh, you know, explanation of what's of what's going on, um, and uh, I um, I'm 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 uncomfortable with it. 
I'm uncomfortable with this with this whole presentation um, uh, that I'm hearing from you know from ADOS people. Um, anybody who comes from the West Indies has been under has 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 descended from people who are um, uh, you know who have uh, been in uh, worked on the on the sugar plantations for at least a, a century and a half or so. They have been subjected to uh, slavery, and uh, and ninety percent, ninety five percent of the Africans who came to the Western Hemisphere came to either the West Indies or northeastern Brazil. So there's a very small percentage of of Africans who came to the to the uh, what becomes the United States, the mainland, um, you know, English colonies. And I feel like you're you're separating out um, people who really have, uh, you know, uh, uh, common interests uh, unnecessarily. Uh, particularly, that's that's true of talking about Mexicans. I mean, you know, the 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 southwest of the United States was overwhelmingly um, uh, people of Spanish Spanish speaking, you know, uh, uh, Hispanic descent. Uh, mixed with with native peoples, and uh, their land was stolen from them by European Americans. Um, uh, Texas was was uh, was created as a slave empire by uh, plantation owners, and uh, and mo most of the of the people who were landholders in Texas were expropriated by those slaveholders. The reason that they needed independence from Mexico was because Mexico did not have slavery. It was illegal. So, you know, uh, we're, if we don't put together, uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the interests, find the common interests of people of color, in, you know, in particular, um, and then um, uh, find the common interests with working people um, uh, in general, uh, uh, I think that we're we're just we're we're um, we're isolating ourselves. Each of us is isolating ourselves. My whole pur purpose, you know, in uh, in doing this show with Tamara, is to both acknowledge that there are these divisions and clashes of interest, and find ways to uh, to uh, figure out a just. Uh, solution to the to the problem of um, of solidarity of how we're going to uh, to uh, work together and I'm I I mean there's there really there really has to be some sense about a two-way street here in order for there to be communication and uh, um, you know and a resolution of some of these we uh, some of these differences. Let let me also point out that the kind of system that emerged in this country historically uh, was was a system of racial oppression. Whereas in the uh, and that was because there were too many too many people who became called white in this country to um, uh, 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 to uh, have a system in which the the uh, the whites could have could afford to to distribute property um, in the in the in the Caribbean. So let there me, there is a so let me just finish. There is a large group um, uh, of uh, of European Americans who were propertyless in the 17th century and into the 18th century, and in order to maintain control over the over the slave population. They were um, given a, uh, a a privileged status, but it it actually undermined their um, uh, their economic position. It did not get them out of uh, out of this situation of being propertyless. In the West Indies, it was an entirely different system. There were too few whites, Europeans, and so mixed race people became the uh, uh, the social control strata. And uh, yes, there. So th there are two very different systems that were at work. Um, 
in this country, you know, the the uh, this this idea that everyone, I mean, uh, okay, I I don't want to go on, uh, keep on going in this because I'm getting into something that's too convoluted, convoluted, um, but uh, uh, but I I'm what I'm arguing for is a um, uh, a, a, a a clear analysis of why um, chattel slavery, hereditary chattel slavery, came to be the basic labor force of this, uh, of, of this country when, um, uh, and, and, uh, and why that was the, that was the position of choice between, the, for the, you know, the, the people who were the most, um, uh, the, were the, the, the owners of the most capital and the most property in this country. Um, uh, there's a, there are reasons for it. So that's that's all I wanted I wanted to say. And they're not simply they don't simply have to do with targeting African Americans. They have to do with a whole system of social control. Um, so, oh. well, let me let me back up. I wanted to jump in to address some of the things you were saying, and and how you don't understand Ados isolating our justice claim. First of all, let's talk about why the distinction is necessary. If you were enslaved in the Caribbean, don't they have CARICOM or something like that working on their reparations? If you had issues with colonizers in Africa, isn't your justice claim with those colonizers? I'm, we have to have our specific claim because it's bad enough that the government tries to pawn off excusing not paying us reparations because they can't identify who we are. That's a bold-faced lie. They've got records. They know more about who we descend from than even we do ourselves. So that's a bold-faced lie because they want to try to escape paying us the reparations we're due. They know they kept great records when they insured us as their property. So they know full well who we are distinctly in this country who built the wealth in this country. We are not saying as ADOS that the immigrants who were enslaved in the Caribbean islands aren't due reparations. We're not saying that Africans aren't due some form of repair. We're not saying that indigenous people aren't due some form of repair. Let me stop right there. The Cherokee and the Seminole Indians also owned us as slaves. They had children with us and the whole nine yards. And yet you got people, ADOS people, who came up on enslaved with the Seminole and the Cherokee Indians who deny them reparations while allowing white people to pay for their repair through those tribes for $5 they bought their repair. And yet the ADOS that descend from Indian slavery, from the Cherokee and the Seminole Indians, they're still fighting for their reparations to this day. And that is their right by law to be repaired. They see none of that. So yeah, it is time for ADOS people to become very self-interested. It is in our energy being spread all over the place to ensure everyone else is comfortable. That's got us sitting in the race to being the permanent underclass in the country our ancestors built with their lives. Everything you see around you is because of my ancestors. It has nothing to do with the Caribbean people being enslaved. It has nothing to do with the Africans, although they owe us too. The Nigerians sold us. Lots of those immigrants coming here from Africa, if you would dig a little deep, you would see they too come from slave traders. So no, it's time for us to be selfish. 
Uh, to my next point, I'm trying to wrap this up, but I have to touch on this. You talked about white identification. Well, we've studied that. We've studied how the Irish became white. We studied how people came over to this country, but let me help you understand with two points. We were here before America was even America. We were here. Okay, so the bottom line is you've got people coming in as indentured servants, which the CBC recently referenced us as to try to quiet the noise on this reparations claim. They're trying to change history. We were here before America was even formed to work this land. And you've got immigrants that were able to come in here as indentured servants and become identified as white. You read the book, how the, how the Irish became white. So you've got all these other groups, Mexicans included, who are on the census claiming to be white. They're claiming to be white because there's privilege in being white. You guys aren't the ones the police are annihilating without cause. You guys aren't 40% of the homeless in this country, you're not experiencing rates of unemployment at 40%. That's not your struggle. So even to identify as white because your skin is light, it, it, it gives you privilege in this country. But you can look at my brown skin and decide to discriminate against me. It doesn't matter how many degrees I have. It doesn't matter how much experience I have. The government has been complicit in our demise in this country, and it is on the government to fix us. We don't need to be made equal by a lot of these social programs that people want to lift. One tie lifts all boats. No, 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 no. Because when you lift everybody, we're still on the bottom. We need an advantage. And that's yeah. what we're fighting for, for our people. One yeah. last point. I want to ask you, since you think that the repair should go to all people of color, which I hate that term, that's why we have the ADOS distinction. It's easy for us to get lost in translation when you lump us together as people of color. Did the Japanese share their reparations? Didn't they have a distinct group of Japanese in the internment camps that collected on their reparations? Even with the Jews, did all Jews receive repair from Germany for the Holocaust? Or were there specific Jews to receive that repair? I'm saying it makes it much easier for this country not to dilute the trillions that we're owed when we have a distinction such as American descendants of slavery. So um, those were my talking points to counter your position on why the ADOS distinction is needed. We love everyone, but that's been the problem. We've been loving on everyone. None of these groups thought to give us any slice of their repair. And like I said, even the Seminole and the Cherokee Indian gave white folk repair for $5. What they still deny our descendants of Indian slavery the repair we're due by law, by the civil right. They are owed those reparations and they're still fighting. So that's my position. Okay, and I um, I am uh, 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 very, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable being in this position here because I agree with much of what you were saying. Um, and, uh, and what I'm trying to do is figure uh -oh. out a way to- Hello? Uh, can you hear me? What happened to David? <laughs> What's that? Uh oh. Hello? Hello? Um. Okay, family. I don't see David. He disappeared. I'm. I. Okay. Okay. I'm, maybe I'm he's back. coming back. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, we, I think, uh, okay, perfect. Oh, there he is. you blacked out. I missed you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, what yeah. Happened? yeah it, I dropped out of the, uh, of your screen. I don't know. I think I'm, I don't know what, I think I dropped off altogether, but there's a message that says I'm in the show now. So, yes. um, 
uh, anyway. Did you back up um, to what you were trying to say? Uh, what you said I, when you dropped off? I missed all of that. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm 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 saying that. Um, I, I don't know. I kind of lost my train of thought here. I, I remember the last words. You're uncomfortable with this position. You came on to marriage I, show and then you dropped yeah, out. I don't, I don't want to be put in the position of uh, re, of uh, of you know interfering in a in a um, in a discussion that really should be held by um, primarily by I know you don't like the word but people of color. All right. I am here. I'm, no, I'm talking about ADOS talking with um, uh, Latinx folks, with native, you know, with Native Nations people, resolving these issues from the perspective of the oppressed groups in this in this country. Uh, I don't want to get into the middle of that. What I need to do, to do is to figure out ways that I can relate this to European Americans. One of the ways that I can do that is to get is to get the un, to to develop the understanding that privileges, that racial privileges in this country are meant primarily to maintain social control, not just over ADOS and other oppressed groups, but also over working class whites. So that working class whites have um, uh, do not have benefits that they would get. They, they clearly have a differential, a privileged position compared to oppressed people like ADOS and uh, uh, Native Nations and Latinx folks. Um, but compared to what their, their position would be if there was solidarity among these groups, in other words, if white European Americans rejected the racial privileges, they would be much better off in terms of power and in terms of their, 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 uh, their standard of living. And I need to explain that to European Americans in a way that they can understand that the expropriation of people's labor, of, of ADOS people's labor um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the unpaid forced labor system of, of uh, uh, hereditary chattel slavery and also in the uh, uh, Jim Crow era, the sharecropping system um, has undermined them, undermined their position. Because when you can do that to one group of working people, it undermines all groups of working people. So I've got to figure out a way to explain that, to you know, to bring that, to bring that perception, and that concept, uh, that that uh, uh, that framework. To, uh, uh, to European Americans, that we are not better off because of, of slavery and, and sharecropping and Jim Crow and the racial oppression that's going on today. We're actually worse off, all right? Even though when you look at us uh, in comparison to, uh, uh, to Africans, um, there is a, uh, there's a, 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 a chasm, there's a tremendous inequality. But if you break down European Americans by class rather than simply by race, you find that there is a whole class, a working class of European Americans who is not receiving uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, these, uh, um, they're not receiving uh, the benefit, benefits to the extent that, uh, that looking at them looking at, at European Americans as whites without making those class distinctions um, does. And, and that in effect make, makes it almost impossible for, for, uh, for uh, people who are trying to figure out ways to bring working class European Americans, not into just simply into, the, into, the, into um, um, uh, association, but into right relationship with um, African Americans and with um, other oppressed groups, there's the the opposite of of uh, of, of privilege is oppression, not uh, a class benefits. All right, um, and 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 um, yes, Shamika, you're absolutely right. 
convict leasing and mass incarceration have been part of the of this whole process. Uh, and Justin is also right. We should be uncomfortable. European Americans uh, uh, should be uncomfortable. So you know that that and 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 ADOS the movement has uh, has a good uh, reason to um, uh, to uh, 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 intensify that discomfort. Let me let me put it that way, because only then are we going to have a have a. Uh, uh, um, uh, a, a real honest conversation about what, you know, what the, you know, the, uh, the wealth of this country is built on. Now, Egberto is here. Uh, can you hear us, Egberto? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Yeah. I hi, can... hi, Egberto. Hi, Angela. Hi, hi David. How y'all doing? Yeah. Politics Bless done right. You. Egberto Willis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's been our, our, our regular uh, contributor and uh, sorry, I didn't want to uh, uh, take up all that time. You know, oh, no, I, no, thank you for the exchange. And thank yeah. you for being courageous enough to, to have this exchange. Uh, yeah, it is uncomfortable. Yeah. But, uh, we've been uncomfortable for a long time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's and time I do to I share the discomfort. <laughs> I am not uncomfortable. <laughs> What I believe I'm Trump is never not uncomfortable. But I am not uncomfortable at all. all. I think, can I say something? Because I've yeah, listened absolutely. to the yes. entire conversation, you know? And maybe it's because I'm one of those nerdy engineers by training. I don't know if that's the reason why. And by the way, Angela, I don't know if, uh, if Tamara told you, but I'm one of those foreign blacks, you know, like those Latino blacks from Panama, you know what I mean? So... <laughs> Oh, now I can't hear you. <laughs> you can't hear me? Oh, I just heard you now. Yeah, now I hear I you. Said, I said, no, I've seen you in action when my brother Chris from Sacramento was on with another ADOS. I saw you and I was trying to jump in and I heard, I heard you. I, I, know, I know you. I see you. Okay. Okay, well, <laughs> let me, I want to add to the discussion though, because I think it's so, I numerically speaking and all of that, I think it's so simple, right? Like I said, I'm an ally to ADOS, but I get that offensive irk when I hear even something that you said today. You know, when you say things like um, the yeah, some of those Nigerians did sell black folk to um, to America. I've been talking that for a long time because you and I have the same grievance as being somebody in, 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 in Latin America and the Caribbean that those people sold us to. Right. So, I mean, we share all those things in common. I don't I don't want American reparations as a as a as a black man who came over here. I don't want American reparations, but that's not going to stop me for fighting for reparations. What happens, I feel on a lot of sides is uh, a, a lot of black people on a lot of American black people, in my opinion, they 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 they, they allow the, the crumb mentality. If you understand what I'm saying, and let me explain uh, here in Houston. We are a very integrated city, more so than any other city in the country, meaning with Latinos, Blacks, and Whites. It's sort of an even keel around the, the state. But if you look at the power structure, the power structure is still white. And what the white power structure does is it leaves set aside, and then you have big fights between the Black and the Latino community fighting for the crumbs, okay? So it's a false choice. What we hear a lot, as black immigrants is you come to our universities and you take our spots. You come to America and you get these things that really are due us. In my, in my case, I'm saying, but no, that's not the reality. The reality is I, when I went to the University of Texas, I didn't realize, I didn't understand then coming from Panama that there was a quota system as far as how many people how many minorities you need to have in the in, in, in the university and all of that, which I thought was hogwash, right? In other words, let me tell you what I mean by that. That a black Caribbean uh, Latino gets into the University of Texas, if black folk in America accepted that uh, some there's going to be some quota system, we shouldn't be going against your quota system. So the fight isn't with the immigrant. The fight is with those people who snowed 
black Americans into thinking that, well, we brought somebody because of the pigmentation of their skin. And when, however, when the argument is made uh, towards you took our spot, they've made it a fight between you and me, which is a standard thing that happens in, in Houston, right? The fight is between the Latinos and the blacks when it comes to these set-asides. There shouldn't be no damn set-asides. We have all the rights for all this stuff. We know that there are reasons why, uh, we know that racism is the reason why a lot of black folk in America don't get into universities. We also know that that racism doesn't start at the door of the university, but at the door of the elementary school. Because the truth of the matter is if you take somebody out of a high school in the middle of a ghetto that the teachers care nothing about the kids, and you put them in a university of Texas or a Harvard or a Stanford, or, or you're setting them up to fail. So the, the argument, I, I think, and I'm not talking about you because you've been very cogent in the argument that you made on the screen today. But the arguments that you hear about ADOS, and on this part, I do blame you and all the other cohorts in that it is, I think, incumbent on you guys to stop the type of arguments that say things like you've taken our spot because it simplifies something that, or rather, it complicates something that is rather simple. We didn't take a damn thing away. Maybe we were used, not, uh, not on our part, but we were used by a system that continuously put pits people against each other to maintain power. White supremacy does that. And white supremacy ain't white because Oprah is a part of white supremacy. You don't hear Oprah talking about Donald Trump. You don't hear Jay-Z talking about Donald Trump. You don't hear any of these guys. We have to use our heads. And what I think is a problem with A, I love ADOS as the people in ADOS. I hate ADOS as a movement that, 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 allows an exclusionary side point on it. I hate that. And the reason why is while I can compartmentalize that, I can compartmentalize what you are saying. Most of us from the immigrant community see it as an attack, just like when I came here. When I came here to the United States, and I'm sorry for taking so long, but I wanted to kind of make the point. When I came here to the United States, uh, the and, and I understand why, and I could deal with it because I understood why. But to the to somebody that doesn't, it looks funny. I came over here, believe it or not, the people that accepted me first were white people. Okay? Those were the people, as black as I am, the people that accepted me, this, I had a deep accent, okay? Just to tell you before I modify my accent. But the people that accepted me first, I had to make an intentional effort and I mean that it was intentional. I made an. Int I went into the Afro uh, Afro American C Culture Committee at, at the University of Texas, and they, the, the way they would talk to me was like, a, "Well, you're an import, or 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 you are. Uh, you don't get it." When I said I was a Malcolm X supporter and not particularly a Martin Luther King supporter, I was like, "You just don't understand." And I'm like, "No, I do understand. That's just my flavor. I, you know, my flavor was Malcolm X." Okay, now. I, I I didn't when they pushed me aside. I didn't run away from okay uh, my black people. I stayed with my black people as far as at the University of Texas is co is concerned. But what I'm saying is many times there are concerted efforts that uh, that 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 the, the white supremacy uses to pit people against each other. And I think some people within the ADOS movement are simply falling for that. That's my say. Thank you so much. Okay. And and so I want to take thank a few, you. I want to take a few minutes. Take it. Take some time, Angela. But I have a few things that I want to say before the before we have to shut off. We only have four minutes left. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Well, real quick. No, no. Uh, I'm glad for your commentary, but I need you to understand something. Uh, I've learned in my spiritual walk to don't take things personal. I think you guys as black immigrants need to understand that the ADOS fight is not personal. It's not against you. If you guys will tune in to Yvette Carnell's Breaking Brown show every Monday and Wednesday evening, uh, I think it's around 930 Eastern Standard Time and Antonio Moore show from Tone Talks, everybody gets it. Even the black white supremacist, like an Oprah, like a Kamala, like a Barack Obama. 
We don't discriminate. We understand that white supremacy comes in all colors. We love you guys immensely. We love all people. And that's been a lot of the problem. So please understand this. Being pro-ADOS does not mean we're anti-immigrant. And if you can just hold on to that as we fight for our repair in the country that our ancestors built all of what you see, all of this wealth with their lives. I'm telling you the things I've been learning about the breeding farms from the rapes that we've endured, from the sodomy of our black men and how we're still broken. Understand me, reparations, it's not just for slavery. It's for a crude, ongoing systemic racism, oppression and disadvantage yeah. in the country we built. Yeah. With yeah. Go ahead, David. I agree with you. That that point is, uh, is absolutely well taken. Uh, we need to have more discussion about about who built this country and and why it was it was that way. But I want to mention something that I heard on after the debate last night, and I think it's really important for people to uh, uh, to consider um, the engagement in politics in this in this cycle. You know, now starting in 2020, is uh, those people who are very or extremely engaged in politics. Uh, come out uh, in, in, among voters, come out as 70% for Democrats and 76% for Republicans, okay? Now, there are smaller numbers of Republicans. Um, so, you know, but I, I, I want to get these public opinion polls out there. However, when you look at the core base of the Democratic Party, the level of engagement is much lower. That is for Black for Latinx folks and for young people, it's in the low 50s. Yes. Okay? So the, the Democratic Party has failed thus far to engage those folks um, you know, who are really their core constituency. And all of this BS you know, that people are saying about how we're gonna, we, we need to get moderate Republicans and you know, people who are, uh, uh, who are, uh, un, uh, uh, what do you call it, independents and all of that stuff is really, really dangerous thinking, I th in my opinion. And so the, the ADOS movement has got to think of itself in those terms as, as mobilizing, uh, you know, folks for, a, um, uh, for a, uh, an autonomous set of demands. You know the, the the labor movement in this country has has also done um, has also done the same kind of thing as you're talking about about the uh, about African Americans. Uh, the labor movement has been been supporting Democrats to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, and uh, and they've gotten nothing for it. Go ahead, Angela. Sorry, I mean, <laughs> that's I'm okay. We. I, I'm so glad we had this time together in the words of Carol Burnett. I love her. But uh, Tamara is telling me we're done. Yeah. We are going to have to come back. <laughs> this has been so much fun for me. All right. Uh, I tell you, I've been threatening to start Friends of ADOS television. And <laughs> this is my first experience being on camera. <laughs> I I hope I did the conversation justice. Yes. I'm very you did. passionate. Yes, I'm very passionate did. about all of us, but my Thank people, you. ADOS, they they uh, you know, I just am. So I thank you guys. We have to come back. We have to do this again. Absolutely. Maybe uh, Tamara will let us take over the show another another time. <laughs> but I thank we you have all to figure you. out how to get that glitch going, you know, so that yes. she she can't <laughs> can't be heard on the on on air but uh thank you and and uh and yes uh, thank you this has been an honor and a privilege to be amongst both of you i've learned a lot and i'm going to take everything you said into consideration as i continue to speak up loud and proud for ados thank you okay thank you. Angela. i learned a lot as well <laughs> thank you audience we love you guys thank you all of you your comments thank